All right. So everybody, we have a special interview for you. And if you're listening to us, whether it's the radio, the YouTube channel, the podcast, we really appreciate it. And we're thankful that you are listening. We're really growing leaps and bounds. And we hope that you just share this interview or share, you know, what you're listening to regardless, because uh, we are putting out a lot of good interviews with a lot of great people. And I appreciate everyone that's listening. Again, like, subscribe, share on whatever platform you're listening to. Uh, we have Gary Rowan, he is on today. He has authored two uh, science fiction books and also two poetry books. We're gonna kick a little bit of that around today and also talk about writing and poetry in general. So Gary, first of all, thanks for coming on the program. I'm jealous of where you are right now in sunny Orlando, Florida, because I'm in a different spot than I usually am, which I'm usually in your spot, but thanks so much for coming on. I appreciate your time today. So glad to do it. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I tell authors that you make connections and you build on those connections because uh, a friend of yours who's an author may have somebody a resource, and uh, that's how this came about because a fellow author, uh, Lisa Skinner, uh, put me in touch with you, and, and that's what I try and tell authors because I'm also a publishing consultant. So, well, we talk. I talked to her about all, um, Alzheimer's, and she was very good on the program and I'm thankful for her to come on. And like I said, I'm thankful for you to come on. So mm -hmm. just kick this around in general. I did kind of give a small synopsis, Gary, of, you know, who you are, but can yeah, you tell a people bit. a little bit about you in general? Yeah, I got into the uh, writing profession, I would say back in uh, high school because mm -hmm. uh, I learned actually junior high, I got really the bug, so to speak. And then in junior high or in high school, I was almost thrown out of high school for a, um, a short story that I wrote. And then seeing this uh, TikTok thing of go slap a teacher, um, that's kind of what I wrote that, that uh, almost got me thrown out of, of, of high school. And that was back in the 60s. Hmm. So I knew the power of my words because I, I was... Uh, uh, brought into the assistant principal and, uh, you know, I was spoken to. And so I then went into uh, junior college. And in junior college, actually, I wrote the book, uh, Look at Me World, while I was in a logic course, because I was so bored with the teacher because his voice was so, I won't imitate it because it's, it, it's grading. It's like the thing with it on the chalkboard. That's the reaction people have. But uh, I, every day, people, students were saying to me, what'd you write today? What'd you write today? And then my parents and I formed a publishing company in the 70s. Hmm. And I went out into the world to sell the books that we had for sale. And then we decided to publish my book that became Look at Me World. In the intervening time, I... Uh, hooked up with a friend of mine who was at one of our radio stations here. She wanted to do a show on science fiction with our local college, Rollins College. Mm. So we did this show for about two years, and it was uh, mm. about science fiction. We incorporated into it interviews with authors, events that were taking place. We knew about reviews of books, movies, and television that we were aware of and anything else dealing with science fiction. And at that time, I also wrote several different short stories. One uh, years later was published in Computers, Legends, Lies, and Lores. And a friend of mine uh, for a long time, Charles L. Fontenay, also had a short story in it because I told him about it, told him submit the short story. And the one I wrote was called The Test. And it was a Twilight Zone type of scenario where there's a, a guy, he's a former college student or just a, a worse of a college student. And there's a, a thing in the paper and it says, you get X number of dollars for this, uh, so this uh, test that, that we do. And so um, what they do is they put you away from society for three weeks Mm -hmm. to see what you're doing 
is what he was told. But with every psychological thing, that's not what they were studying. And that's what the story is all about. So then when I was, uh, I, you know, moved around and did some things in Orlando and worked in different professions. I then went back to college to get my degree I had not gotten earlier. Right. And so I got the degree in writing or, or English at University of Central Florida right. and learned my craft so much more than I ever thought I would. So I wrote a story called The Vivisection because I wanted something relating to the word test. And if you know what that word is, it's animal lab testing. And whenever you write something, you want your title to convey something of what the book is about or what the short story is about. That's also when you have a cover, you want the cover to convey something for the reader to get excited about some in some way and, and, and you know, know that they're getting into something that relates to something in, in the stories. Mm. So this time, and I don't really like sequels for me to write, but then again, this wasn't a sequel, but this was the same premise, the same agency, totally different character, totally different concept of, of the way she handled the situation. Plus, I researched and let women on UCF campus know what I was researching. And I said, if you had these circumstances, what would be the most important thing to you? And everyone said, clean panties. I, I swear to God, that's what they said. And that story is the vivisection in the collection journey. And it was one of the first that I did it with this class. There are others in journey that are. And then other stories that I wrote before. And you can see a clear difference in the writing form. Because in, in the vivisection, I used the uh, technique of letters that the character writes to herself to kind of a, a diary. And that's a, a, that was a great resource tool to use to convey how she feels and all these other aspects. And there were certain clues that I put in that lead you along to the end of the story as I did the first one, because that's what a writer also has to do. The writer has to put, if it's a short story or a novel, you have to put something in that is a clue of where you're going. Give you an example. I have a book that a PR firm handed or sent to me recently. It's on Nazi Germany. And I discussed with the PR person the, the book. And what the uh, author has is a situation where a character from, I, I suspect, Poland goes into an embassy of, of Nazi Germany and talks to uh, the ambassador of that particular building or that embassy. And he whips out a gun and shoots the ambassador. And then the, it's in France and the French authorities take him to jail. Well, when you write, that has to have some play of something relating to something. And the author doesn't do a very good job of relating how that is tied in to the rest of the story. Now, in my case, I start you with the very beginning of how it relates. And I'll give you an example. Um, the story traces, I think it's called, let, let me see which one it is. Uh, it's in my collection called Slotsky's World. And I think it, if I remember, that title is uh, Traces. Yeah, Traces. And it's uh, Stacy and Myron Beagle love their residence in Christmas, Florida. Mm. Until one day, after shopping in Titusville, they returned home to find it completely gone. You as a writer have to do something like that to jumpstart the reader to want to read your story. So traces, that's a clue. Then there's what I just read, and it's almost word for word from the story. The point is, 
it leads you into, hey, what happened to their house? And I won't tell what happened to their house, but see, that's what you've got to do to, to uh, read the, the story. There are others that I have just like that, but that's how I learned my craft at UCF, you know, University of Central Florida. And I'm, I'm so in debt to what I learned and I had some fabulous uh, professors. And so a writer is always learning too. And a writer is like Robert Newton Peck always said, you are like a TV camera and you're always on and you're all, always observing everything because you don't know when you're going to use it as a writer. Mm -hmm. I am currently working on a story and it takes me some time to uh, do it because I've got uh, some personal situations going on. Sure. But it is, I started it and I started it with just the name of a character and um, let, let me see if I can find it. Mm -hmm. And it's the name of a character named, here it is. And the character's name is Speak. That's the name, S-P-E-A-K. And I thought, what, what person would have a name of, uh, of Speak? Now, Speak is not even an Earth person, but uh, uh, from the planet Reptis. So, again, I'm giving you clues with the, with the reference to Reptis, and it comes in later with where the story is going. So I was watching, because I get stream services, and I was watching WPXI and, uh, in, in Pittsburgh, or no, w, yeah, WPXI in Pittsburgh. And they had a story, but all the stations in Pittsburgh had this story. And it was about a, an animal that ran across the, the road. And it was, apparently was a pet of someone. And this animal got out. And the police were all looking for this animal. And then they later found this animal. Well, if I say what the animal is, it gives you a hint of like, like reptis. Anyway, I went in and I, I came up with, I, was, I, I have the service ship. And they shop for me because I don't drive. So I loved the, uh, the, the, the person's name. His name was Fleck C, F-L-E-K-C. And I love the name Fleck. I mean, because who, who would you know named Fleck? You know, so I said to, to Shiv, I said, I love that name. So I have Fleck D, who works for Shiv in Pittsburgh and I know the names of the stores there and so he's out shopping and he encounters uh, a situation but it also was in Pittsburgh what's going on right now like other cities is the police are going crazy with motorcyclists and what the motorcyclists are doing is they're doing wheelies and they're doing all kinds of things and they're, they're, there's car drivers doing the same thing with the motorcyclists, and I saw this happen on our local freeway, uh, Interstate 4, I'm going along when I did have a car, and a motorcyclist comes barreling past me, stands up on the seat, and just, you know, the scene in, in uh, Titanic, where he's hauling up in, in, in top of the world, you know, whatever. That's what I thought. And so I didn't realize I would use it relating to, but it, it, it all, and so the Fleck D, is a character in Pittsburgh. So a writer is always like Robert Newton Peck said, observing and taking notes, mental notes, and then you don't know when it will come back into some story that uh, the writer is writing. Again, this is Gary Rowan. He has authored two science fiction books and also two books on poetry. We're going to get into that right now quickly as we move toward the end of the interview, Gary, because I want to talk about this so, you know, writing about science fiction, I mean, we see, obviously, being from the Orlando area, you know this too, how huge Star Wars has blown up, not only at Disney, but even before it was in Disney. Oh, yeah. You know, these yeah. movies were huge, you know, since they've, you know, come out. Yeah. Uh, so my question is, is how did you get into science fiction? Was it something with the movie, whether it was Star Wars or even before that? Well, how did you get into writing these books and why that topic in general? 
basically because I always liked science fiction, I, I came in to Frederick Brown, Ray Bradbury, hmm. Richard Matheson, and Matheson was a major influence of Bradbury, uh, Arthur Clarke, everybody knows Asim Isaac Asimov, and even <laughs> um, uh, L. Ron Hubbard. Now, L. Ron Hubbard has contributed so much to the genre of science fiction with his writer of the future program that has introduced thousands, I mean thousands of writers into the fold of the present day science fiction. And it's a contest that, that people uh, get involved in and they publish a, an edition every year. So I, I am tied in with them in that I review the books, but the fact is I got in years and years ago from watching Twilight Zone, The Outer Limits, and the things, and I said, I can do that, I can do that, and that was the test. As I grew as a writer, I told more stories, found that I was telling more stories in the science fiction genre, simply because I like the premise of what if. Since I have been a critic, I had a book that came to me from Dahl at Publishing, it was 99 word short stories. Now that's a true test of a writer. Well, I was at the convention in Orlando called Megacon mm -hmm. and I'd heard about a thing that was taking place and it was tell a short story in 66 words. So I was sitting next to a woman and I said, I heard there's something called 66 word short story collection. And I wrote something and this is what I wrote. It's called Mother-in-Law. Uh, wait a minute, not that one. Okay, wait a minute. This is the one that I wrote for that collection. And it is 66 words, exactly. Identity theft. I got crushed and now my whole little round green body is purple, filled with pain. And I mean, it hurts. My entire insides feel like liquid and I'm being married to many others I don't even know. Now I am a prisoner in a clear-like substance. Oh, woe is me. What has happened? I was green. Now the Welch's name is all over me. <laughs> that's pretty good. Yeah, and that's 66 words. And, and so that's the, tough. Yeah, that's tough yeah, to do. Yeah. But, but I mean, it's a whole story in itself. Yeah. The test of it was that to, to pull it off. And then I find out she's the editor. She was the editor, the woman next to me at the Megaton. Wow. I think with my training of having written uh, poetry, because the poetry I always wrote, people said, well, you're writing in the style of E.E. E. Cummings. I don't capitalize, I don't punctuate. I just let it go and let it flow. And I let it line a little here, a little here, a little here. But what you learn with writing poetry is you have to tell what you're going to tell in as few words as you can, but you pick those words and each one has to have some bearing and meaning of where you are going with your poetry. And it's a much tighter controlled piece of writing because you only have certain number to do with it in each line, each stanza, whatever. I was at an Oasis convention in Orlando and we had a discussion about poetry. I was the moderator and I had such fun, really fun because there was a husband and wife there, they're teachers and they said, you gotta learn iambic pentameter, you gotta learn this. So my first question was, what is it about poetry that people don't like? Why do people shy away from reading poetry Right. Basically, my premise or my belief is that we had to perform for teachers so often that we didn't, uh, we weren't allowed to have our own belief of what the poem is about. We had to see what they saw, what the teacher saw. Mm -hmm. And I was always kind of a rabble rouser in junior college because uh, another teacher, she didn't like what I was doing. I raised my hand because she was talking about Henry Wandsworth Longfellow poem. And I said, uh, have, did, you, did you ever meet him? She said, no. 
I said, did you ever correspond with him? I said, and she says, no. I said, well, you know, and she says, she, she didn't like where I was going with it. But my, my whole thing was, because, and I said, why? And she says, well, he's been dead all, this, all these years. Right. And then I let in and said, well, if he's been dead all these years, how can you tell us what he's saying? If you never spoke to him, you never, she says, Mr. Rowan, I'm not going to follow you anymore. She didn't like that I served uh, her class and put in, but the thing is, I think that's one of the reasons. Plus, the husband and wife saying, you got to learn the rhythm, you got to learn. No, you don't. You have to learn that your voice is as, as relevant to what you read as anybody else's. And I think through the years, the number of people who read for pleasure has always been four to five percent of the national average of people in the country. And what writers like uh, uh, James Patterson and others do is they try to make people more aware, hey, you read and you will enjoy and just enjoy what you read for your own benefit don't think you have to perform and tell what it's about. And I think that's why it's always been low because when people get out of college or high school, they don't want to touch it because they've always had to perform. They've always had to do a report. They've always gotten graded. And if it's not what the teacher wants, you know, Moby Dick for so many years, I couldn't even watch the movie with Gregory Peck. It was only due to the, the remake with Patrick Stewart that I decided, hey, I'll watch it. And I enjoyed it because of Patrick Stewart. I gave it a second look. And that was, that was 25, 30 years later. You see what I'm saying? And, right. and it's because when I was in college, you couldn't enjoy Moby Dick for yourself. You had to perform and say, well, what were the nine gams? What was the significant uh, significance of the nine gams? And you know, so taking that all into consideration, I still wanted to write my own stuff. Right. And I'm very pleased that people love Journey. They love uh, Stotsky's world because I'm always saying, what if this happened? What if this happened? And, and that's the beauty of science fiction. And you can go anywhere you want. And you don't have to really, but, but the thing is, I find that I'm tuned in to what's going on all over the place because a lot of the things, and people say, well, how much of it is you? Very little. Most of it is something that I've observed and something that I uh, know about or am aware is going to take place. So I just, I just add it in and make it, make it fiction. So what do you hope people get out of these books? Out of my books? Right. Just uh, that they uh, enjoy them. They get, la they, they get laughs out of them. They like the character. They like the character of uh, Slotsky, Bear. Uh, mm -hmm. He came to me as a result. I worked in market research, and I found the teddy bear. And he was exactly what I described. But I believe that there's something good that, that lives in him and helps people. And so in that first story, I, I kind of said there was nothing redeeming about him from the very first page. And yet there is because there's something that's inside of him that helps people. And so I think that it transfers over to we all have some guiding force that helps us get through uh, all the things that we get through that, that we're doing mm -hmm. and uh, through especially negative times. There's, there's something, and I know, you know, because I'm going through a, a whole thing of, 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 of a personal nature, and mm -hmm. I keep seeing butterflies. Butterflies here, butterflies there. I went to lunch the other day, and the hostess had a butterfly on her arm, and it, it just, it, in the way, her hand turned in such a way. I said, oh, my God, everywhere I go, there's butterflies. If you read dreams, you know that butterflies mean that uh, you're, you're uh, shedding something and you're, you're having freedom. And so in my case, that's exactly what's going on. And so I read things like that. 
And that's what I put in that there's a guiding force to help uh, people in situations and what the, what the bear gets into are most interesting things. And I have so much fun writing what he gets into and he's a smart ass. And it's kind of me thumbing my nose a little bit at society because mm-hmm. I can't say it, but he can. And, you know, it's, it, it's just the beauty of writing, but the fun of it is, and I hope what people take away from it is they like the way that I tell the story. They want to continue to see uh, stories of this bear. And I know they do, because when the first story came out in a magazine, I got so many letters from people. The editor forwarded them to me. I want more bear stories. I want. I never knew that the one story would jumpstart the whole thing, because I didn't write it to be a series. I just wrote it for the fun of it. And then all of a sudden I saw what was coming in to the magazine and I said, I got to write more stories. And now I just write what I think I want to write in this one, the neighborhood. It doesn't have our neighborhood. It doesn't have him in it. I don't want to put him in it because he's too easy to solve the problem. But I'm so glad to put speak in and the character name of speak. And so I love that the people would love to read it also because, hey, what kind of name is he going to use now? You know, and it's just the fun of it. It's just it's just so much, uh, you know, and, and, and it's it's nice to have people tell me, I really like what you're writing. What, what, what are you where are you going now in the interest, especially if it's the book itself or the, the Kindle or the electronic versions that other companies have, Mm -hmm. I'm all for that. I I don't personally have a Kindle because I don't want it because my eyes are not in such good shape and it's hard enough for me to read it on print, but it's easier for me on print. So that's basically what I I, I would want people to take away from that that this is an author I want to see more stuff from. Right. So as we end, Gary Rowan, where can people find your books, the poetry books in general? Yeah, the poetry book, The Forgotten Father, Coping with Grief, is on Amazon. It's available at any bookstore. You can order it. Uh, the two collections are LegacyBookPublishing.com, uh, BarnesandNoble.com, uh, BooksAmillion.com, Amazon.com, and any other uh, bookstore. They can order the books. And so... Uh, and another thing I want to say is I highly uh, believe in used bookstores. So many authors don't. And I don't because that generates possible sales of your books. And other authors say, well, I'm not getting any money from the used book. Yeah, you are. Because if the, if, if the used bookstore turns a, a reader on to a particular author, that person is like, uh, we're all the same. That person's going to want to read other books of that author. And so, you know, and then look for the brand new ones that are coming. So uh, I've never understood authors who don't like used bookstores. Right. So as we end, Gary Rowan, where can people find your books, the poetry books in general? Yeah, the poetry book, The Forgotten Father, Coping with Grief, is on Amazon. It's available at any bookstore. You can order it. Uh, the two collections are LegacyBookPublishing.com, uh, BarnesandNoble.com, uh, BooksAmillion.com, Amazon.com, and any other uh, bookstore, they can order the books. And so, uh, and another thing I want to say is I highly uh, believe in used bookstores. So many authors don't, and I don't because that generates possible sales of your books. And other authors say, well, I'm not getting any money from the used book. Yeah, you are, because if the, if, if the used bookstore turns a, a reader on to a particular author, that person is like, uh, we're all the same. That person's going to want to read other books of that author. And so, you know, and then look for the brand new ones that are coming. So uh, I, I've never understood authors who don't like used bookstores. Yeah, That's basically, I, I... you know, what I think. No, I agree with you 100%. Gary Rowan here on Fire Breathing Rub. Gary, thanks so much for your time. It was extremely informative. We talked about so many different things yeah. today. 
and I appreciate your time today. Glad to. So glad to.